Whoa. Thank you for tuning in to InRange. This is the first test run of the K Arms KP15 polymer lowers. They were just run like recently, yes? Yeah, the last week of July was when we got the mold into the press to, uh, to do sampling. And, wow. ran, and we ran 50 pieces. 50 pieces, and this one's 48, this one's like 21. 21. This one's two. Number two. Number two. And so the reality is, this means we're getting darn close to the production runs. So what you have to do though, is when this comes out of the mold, it's not ready to go. There have to be what's called secondary operations and you did these by hand. Right, well, first off, comes out of the mold in two halves. Okay. And then it's vibration welded together. So the next major step after testing the mold, we knew the parts came out of the mold relatively well. Mm -hmm. um, There's some processing things we had to do to uh, get the mold running right. But mm -hmm. the next step was test welds with a vibration welder. So this would be the welder here. That's what I'm showing you. Right. So yep. every contact surface between the two halves gets vibrated back and forth at a high frequency, melts and fuses together. That's so cool. So um, serial numbers one through 20 were one type of material we were testing out of the mold and serial numbers um, 21 through 50 were the material that we chose to go with for production. So this is a different polymer blend that Ian's holding? Yes. Oh. They're, they're both 30% uh, glass filled nylon, but they're different brands and have slightly different properties. Okay. So we found that the second one that we ran numbers 21 through 50 with uh, molded the best, welded the best, had the least amount of um, warp mm -hmm. coming out of the mold. So warp happens because the parts have to cool, and as they cool, the, the thicker parts kind of can shrink in. And you accommodate for that in your mold design. So the next step after we had these parts was they had to go for test welding. And there's nests that the each half goes into. And we have what was called development tooling currently where they're making sure that it's it's fitted properly for the part. Um, and starting with the lower serial numbers, they welded together a bit too much. Okay. So the nominal dimensions for all the parts and magazines, the uppers and stuff to fit on got crushed a little bit too much. So, so as stuff they, like this wouldn't happen. Right. Okay. So as they got further into the serial number range going into the material we selected for production, they got the welder dialed in to where dimensions were holding nominally where we want them, which is why you can take that Gen 3 P mag and just have it drop out of there without us filing on the magazine well at all. So we were talking about this, just from the run of one to what, 40, what was the full run? Uh, one through 50. Okay, so this is 48. Right. That's number two. This one we were told came right out of the mold and was welded and no secondary operations have to happen on the mag well immediately right out of there completely right, to spend. Right. And nope. also a slightly small magazine because it'll drop out of this one but on my rifle that one's a little tight. It's, Let me see the mag. To, Gen to... 2 P mag versus Gen ah, 3 P mag. Yeah. So slightly dimensionally different. Yep. But yeah, there there are there is flash that occurs in the welding process all the way around the outside of the receiver. So we got these receivers uh, back from test welding on Thursday of this week, and we promptly set to them with files and razor knives to get them suitable for shooting at the match. So what the audience needs to realize, he said Thursday, today is Saturday. Right. Yeah. So you were doing this yesterday? Yeah, uh, Thursday and Friday before the match, we were getting everything set up. So you might've heard me mention before that the fire control pinholes weren't fully formed in the mold yet because we wanted to make sure we calculated for shrink rate. Uh, they look like they're right on where they need to be. They're undersized. So to finish those out in the selector holes, we uh, used an 80% jig and everything looked like it lined up properly. So we're fairly confident of where the pinholes need to be uh, for actual production. That'll be a revision we make in the mold. Okay. Um, but once we have these with all the flash around them, now we can start looking at actual production techniques. Mm -hmm. How are we gonna put this in a CNC and trim all these surfaces? How are we going to drill the hole for the uh, bolt catch roll pin? How are we going to drill the hole for the selector spring and detent that goes down through there? Um, how are we going to trim out the flash on the inside? So that was kind of part of testing. Like initially you we were trying to break the, the flash off inside the buffer tube with a file just to get these going. Yeah. Flash is really strong on these. The material is noticeably stronger than anything I've worked with before. And so what I had to do is get a reamer. I don't have a shaft on a reamer <laughs> that's long enough yet. We will for production clamp the reamer and a vise and just work the lower back and forth on it to break out all the flash in the buffer tube. Um, we, we experimented with the mag well on the tighter ones. We had a couple, we have an aluminum um, magazine well brooch and mm -hmm. a brooch takes the oval shape that you can cut in a CNC for a mag well and makes it square for magazines. So we ran that through a few of the tighter ones and we're thinking that, you know, doing a uh, brooch that's smaller because we don't need to cut 
round a square, but just to shave the uh, flashing from the weld off there might be the way to go for consistent um, trimming of the magazine well. Yeah, so these parts right here are not round. You're literally just cleaning them up. Right. That's all you're doing. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this, this is the cool thing now that we actually have sample parts so we can start moving forward with all the things to get real production lined up. Uh, there are a few things we need to revise in the mold based on feedback from the welder. Um, there's a few spots back in the buttstock where they want more material added, which means taking material out of the mold, which is easy. Um, it's harder to put material back into the mold to make things smaller. So we're going to remove material in the mold, add some plastic back here, give it an even better weld than we have. But the weld as is uh, seems phenomenal. It's very strong. We tried to do some pull apart testing with it and uh, it looks like it's going to be very solid. So amazingly, this, this all happened over the last week. You get this thing on Thursday, and, and by hand, you do secondary operations. And here we are on Saturday, and you guys are both shooting these guns on the clock at the two-gun action challenge match. Well, if you want to find out if there's uh, gremlins in the works or Murphy's Law is going to happen, here's the place to do it, right? That, that's true. So, no, so, Ian, what are you doing? So what I actually did is I took my 2017 What Would Stoner Do and just pulled the upper off of it and dropped it onto the 2020, the KP-15 lower. So this is the closest thing we're gonna have on today's field of fire the, to a 2020, what would Stoner do? Right. But it's not representative of the ultimate 2020 carbine. So there are a few changes. The barrel and the muzzle device are going to be different on the 2020. Uh, these lowers don't have PDQ levers in them yet mm -hmm. because that's an extra step of complexity that we didn't want Russell doing by hand with a file. <laughs> um, uh, I think that, but the, that's most the, of the lower primarily. guts are the same, the selector, right. the magazine catch, uh, you got your silent capture spring system in there. Yep. So we'll verify that that works. Um, so other than the PDQ lever, the lower is uh, pretty close to how it will be sold other than one of the things we have to do for production is uh, texturing is going to be added. A lot of people have been seeing, oh, they're shiny. Is that going to look like that? No, the machine marks and the shine are going to be taken off now that we know what we need to do to correct the pro you know, any of the issues in the mold. Um, adding the finish is like the last thing you do because if you have to correct anything then you got to go and refinish it yet again right so um, uh, it'll minimize the appearance of the uh, ribbing lines from sink on mm -hmm. the outside and it'll get rid of all those tooling path marks and stuff you see on these ones currently so you've got a pretty much what would stoner do intermediary close to the 2020 but not there yet i do and i am excited to actually shoot it uh, and what are you shooting uh i just grabbed one of my uh, ke 15 patrol carbine uppers mm -hmm. and slapped it on this because it was already zeroed and i knew it was ready to go and you've got a standard buffer system in this. a standard carbine buffer system with yes. an slt2 trigger slt2 trigger but the same ambi selector and ambi um, magazine release and then our buddy tim is out here with this lower and his standard upper which has a red dot and he's got a mil spec fire control group in this with mil spec safety and that's because we want to test what would Stoner do components, not completely what would Stoner do components, and just something that someone might put together right off the shelf and make sure that all three of these are exactly how we want them to work in these test runs. You know, I do find it interesting, without the texturing, it kind of looks like an old Colt uh, A1 yeah, stock. A little bit, yeah. Interesting. Well, it is, in fact, A1 length, and it can accept A1 or A2 butt plates. Uh, the exact fit of your butt plate might vary a bit because the you know there's been a lot of different molds and tooling for butt plates over the years but anything A1 or A2, I'm pretty sure you can mash it on there and get it to fit. Well, I don't know anyone else that puts their very first one through 49 test runs out at the clock, on the clock, like we're gonna do today. So I think this is a really proof of concept to our audience that we have a lot of faith in these things because these aren't even the production lowers quite yet. So let's go out there, let's go shoot, and let's see what happens. Yep. All right, we're coming at you live from the KE Arms Gun Closet, our high-tech testing facility. And I'm gonna do the first test with a KP-15 full auto. Looks like she runs. Nice, quiet signature indoors. We did take note from the internet range safety officers that are looking out for our safety. Definitely gonna get some more lead in our bloodstreams today.
All right, sadly, I did not have a what would stoner do upper with me today, so I was shooting something different. I didn't get the pleasure of shooting one of these. However, I did get the pleasure of holding it. And let me say, right off the bat, the minute I picked this up, and I know it sounds like we're shilling our own thing, but the reality is, man, this feels great. As a test run, this seems like a production product right now. Well, this is the result of hundreds of hours of engineering, consulting with uh, numerous uh, outside contractors, and then um, balancing all those concerns between um, mold design, plastic selection, mold uh, processing, welder uh, processing and tooling, and what it needs to do as a firearm part into a functioning firearm. So Ian, you shot that on the clock today, how'd it go? Great, well, the rifle performed flawlessly. Uh, the guy behind it could have been a little better in some places. Um, I mean, you did out of practice at this point. It's been a while since you've been traveling been a lot, serious. doing a lot of a lot of forgotten weapons. Content. Yeah, yep. uh, but I really like the new grip design on it. It really is better than the other stuff that that was out there um, that we base what was going to do 2017 on. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't even know what to say beyond that. Like the nice thing about it is you just don't notice it. The balance comes in just as good as our original project. Mm -hmm. um, if not potentially even a little better. Yeah. I think this is a stronger receiver. Um, it certainly feels a very subjective thing, but it feels more durable and more robust um, than the earlier iterations of polymer that are out there. I agree with that. It has so. a complete, it has a very strong feel to it. I know that that's very subjective. It, but. It's, it's really interesting. Um, you take the two halves, before they're welded, you're like, this feels flimsy, but when you put them together and, and you get the weld in there, um, I was amazed myself how much stronger the whole thing felt as a solid unit uh, than as the individual components. That's what you had no malfunctions. Right. Sorry, you had no malfunctions anything. No, I'm trying to think. None. No, no I missed. I had a few misses. Uh, we can blame that on the optic or me, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, but no, there were a few places where, frankly, some of the targets were smaller than I anticipated mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't give adequate time to set up a sight picture. Um, there was a spot on, I think it was our first stage, where we had two full-size Ipsex. Mm -hmm. And I was able to hammer those things fast. Um, but the rest of the targets were you know, a lot smaller and took some time. I was happy to see that even Fagan had to take some time to line up on those. So how did your build go today? Uh, everything ran fine. Um, I shot about 90 rounds through it before the match. Uh, torquing on the upper, putting pressure on the magazine, doing all sorts of different things to see if I could induce a malfunction from stresses on it. Um, and with the buffer tube properly cleared out after reaming it, I couldn't do that. Uh, there was, it was um, perfectly fine cycling after I had it appropriately reamed out with all the flash removed. And like I said, that's one of the things as we have the parts now and we're working through processing these, we can figure out the optimum ways for making hundreds to thousands of these things now. I don't believe you had any malfunctions either. Nope. Nope. And then Tim was shooting this lower. I didn't shoot with this lower, but I'm holding it right now. I'm gonna talk about this in a minute. I know he didn't have any malfunctions either. So the very first, man, the very first test runs of these things out the door with you doing hand filing secondary operations, these guns ran flawlessly. So one of the things I was particularly pleased at uh, with, from the design standpoint is the bolt catch interface to the PMAG. Um, we have more than enough overlap from the bolt catch to the PMAG follower there. And as we, we've talked about before, PMAG followers are a little bit shorter front to back. So, um, and all of us had last shot lockback and everything we used today too. Um, I did use an aluminum mag in one of the stages as well. Had no problems with that either. Yeah, so if you can use your, if you can use PMAGs, you have no problem with the aluminum. But that engagement there is much better. This is exemplary of all the extra work and effort and machining operations that are being put into making this two spec, for lack of a better term, for each every lower being identical and properly to the right measurement. Fair? Yep. And on top of that, I just gotta say, while just holding it, seeing this thing in real life now, we saw the 3D printed ones, right? And then we held them, and that was cool. Holding this now, this even is though- way cooler than the 3D printed one. This is, this is this is better than I was hoping, yeah. it personally. And it's only gonna get even better as we get the texturing done and a, and a few little tweaks to make every part more consistent. Yep. Any other thoughts you'd like to add? I'm excited to have this continue to go forward. I'm really excited to see what the, to get my hands on a final actual production iteration. Mm -hmm. I am too, and uh, and getting the texturing and all that. So this is this comes up, but this isn't a, this is not meant to be shilling, but I will let you know this. Um, these are pre-orderable on Brownells, the lowers, as well as the complete Wildwood Stunner Do 2020 
carbine builds, which we haven't done all the videos on yet. We know what it's going to be. We're just working on the video. So eventually there's going to be a whole series of videos. Not only of the progress of this, you're going to see the actual vibration welding process and other secondary operations. Probably not on YouTube. You might have to go to Brownells or other channels because of YouTube's policies. But those are going to be videos, and there's going to be also videos about the continuing What Would Stoner Do 2020 project, all the things we did before, you know, all the kind of destructive testing and et cetera. So stay tuned for all of that. But, man, this is coming to be real. Yeah. Man, I'm excited. Guys, thanks for watching. If you like this stuff, um, consider maybe pre-ordering one of yours if you're interested. This is a, an amazing project, and I really feel, I can't help but think, we've really brought the AR back to its original roots in terms of being lightweight but modern. Yep. Thanks for watching.